Good morning. I'm Mike Lowe. Uh, I work for Indiana University, and my colleague here is Robert Budden from Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. Let me apologize right up front. Uh, the quality of the conference is inversely proportional with the quality of my voice, so I'm going to try and make it through here, but bear with me. Um, so this is a little bit different than the audience that we're used to, I'm thinking, guessing. Uh, normally we're presenting these systems to uh, people who know more about the NSF than we do, uh, but may not necessarily know what OpenStack is. I'm assuming by Wednesday morning that everyone here knows what OpenStack is, and uh, we might need to discuss the National Science Foundation a bit. Um, so traditionally, they've been funding uh, large systems that, that focus on delivering uh, floating point numbers. A um, couple of the most recent ones here, the, the big boys, you know, Stampede right here at uh, UT Austin at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, TAC. Um, a couple of a couple of ones from the from the recent past here, um, and a few months before they funded our systems, they were funding some cloud systems. Um, but these are these are fundamentally different systems because when um, they fund two different kinds of systems: systems that are instruments to study computer science. They are they're designed to study how to build clouds, and then they have clouds that are designed to study everything else that isn't building a cloud, and that's what our systems are. Uh, these awards were made out of uh, what's colloquially, and colloquially known as the uh, Track 2G solicitation. Um, there is a, a multi-year program that, uh, that acquires one or two systems a year. And these all fall under the uh, the HBC umbrella organization known as Exceed. Um, so all the accounts and accounting goes back through that organization, and so does the the first line of support. A um, couple of systems are listed there. These are these are the most recent ones that have been added to Exceed. Um, Exceed's a it's a five year, one hundred and twenty million dollar. Uh, mostly support project to help people get onto these systems and uh, and deliver these resources to, to researchers at institutions. Um, I lifted a few phrases from the solicitation. You may notice that they look a little bit, um, there are some things that kind of stand out, like they mentioned new three times and communities twice and they keep talking about capabilities that we don't already have. And these numbers might sort of illustrate why they're, why they're on about something that's not traditional HPC. Um, only, uh, only a handful of the researchers actually use any of the HPC systems um, that, that are provided. And only a few dozen researchers actually use most of the cycles that are delivered in this country. Um, and they've, they've given a few reasons in surveys so we are, this, this is the question that was asked and these systems are our answer to this question. Uh, slightly unusual, usually the solicitations are for one award. Um, the NSF seemed to think that our responses were meritorious enough to warrant two awards. Um, and I, I think that speaks to the quality of the proposals that we both of our institutions delivered. Uh, so specifically about Jetstream, um, so we focused on user-friendly, um, we focused on delivering a library of, of VMs so that researchers could get started quickly and um, you know, once you log in we wanted to be you know 30 seconds, 60 seconds and you're, you're logged into your VM doing work. We targeted as many disciplines as we could possibly manage. Um, if you take the if you take the numbers and you put them on a rough graph, um, you wind up with this what we call the long tail of science, and that, that's what we are really targeting here. Something bigger than a laptop, but smaller than a, a, a large, largest uh, shared memory machine. Uh, just side note, 
it looks like Bridges fits in very nicely, just right adjacent to, to the community that we were targeting. Uh, so we, um, we also wanted to support some science gateways on our, on our systems. We're going to have some long-running persistent VMs. Um, And one of the other communities that we targeted was the um, EBSCOR states, the, well, they're listed out there. Um, I personally believe it's consistent with both the letter and the spirit of the mission of the National Science Foundation to have more people doing more science. And we're better off by being more inclusive as a project. We can, we should further these aims, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, specifically what we bought. Um, we bought 320 blades, Haswell nodes, um, 24 cores for a blade. All the, all the numbers are listed out there, you can read those. But we apportioned our flavor sizes uh, in, a, in a very specific way because we can only report our usage in terms of itanium CPU hours. So. <laughs> Right, so uh, we can't bill for memory or disk or any of those things. We have to be billed for CPU. So we sort of chopped up the, chopped up the blade, and uh, you know that's what we were, that's what we came up with. Um, it's actually two separate, distinct clouds. Uh, one here at TAC, our partners. Um, the other one in, in Bloomington at IU. Um, we're plugged in both with uh, 100 gig networks uh, back to Internet 2, and we have a, a private network for the Exceed that is uh, 10 gig. There's a, a small development and test cluster that went off to our partners at uh, University of Arizona. Uh, quick, quick diagram of the hardware in Bloomington. Uh, the Texas, is, Texas hardware is, is slightly reconfigured, but it's got all the same pieces. Um, we've got uh, racks of compute with uh, storage and management and, uh, and you know, various and assorted uh, service nodes in the, in the middle there. Um, we peeled off one blade from each of the five racks uh, for, a, for a network node, for a Nova network node. The first three racks got another blade peeled off to the controller nodes. Yeah, not the best diagram, but uh, you sort of get the idea. The, uh, the blades each have two 10 gig links back to each of the chassis switches. Those are stacked. Uh, those go up to the top of rack with, uh, with 4x40 for um, 160 gig aggregate. Means you know, we've got uh, two to one over subscription at this level, uh, being um, 320 gigs from the blades aggregate back into the chassis switches. Uh, four chassis to a rack, those all go up to the top of rack. Uh, top of racks are uh, four by 40 gig the spine switches uh, tied by uh, three 40s, so that's 120 gigs. Should one of them, should one of the paths be broken there. And uh, four by 40 for 160 gigs back off to our core router. A uh, little bit more detail about the uh, service nodes. We used uh, uh, a three-way Galera, uh, MySQL, RabbitMQ cluster there. Um, those are backed by SSDs. And we have a pair of load balancers. Those are, uh, those got 40 gig, two 40 gig NICs each. Um, so they also have 160 gigs aggregate. We put uh, a primary uh, virtual IP with Keep Life uh, on each of those and use DNS round robin to roughly balance between those. Um, if one of those goes down, it takes over the, the primary virtual IP of its, of its mate. So there's a lot of things that we did that, like everybody else, they're not uh, particularly special. You know, you can just sort of follow the stock install docs and, and arrive at the same answer we did. Um, you know, Cinder, Cinder and uh, Clance are backed by Ceph. 
uh, KVM, LiveVert, you know, regular, regular Nova stuff. Uh, we just grabbed the publicly available packaged bits, installed those. Um, slightly more unusual, we use Linux Bridge instead of OBS, uh, VXLAN for our tenant networks. Uh, we grabbed the, what at the time was brand spanking new um, Intel X710 NIX, and they have VXLAN offload. Um, we use Keystone V3 with domains, which is not, uh, not terribly common. Um, we put everything uh, behind HA that we po could possibly afford to do, and all of our deployment is uh, done with, uh, at the Bloomington cluster, is done with SaltStack. Uh, the Texas guys used Puppet, but uh, a little bit more on that later. Uh, stuff that nobody else has. Um, so our partners at Arizona, um, they have created the Atmosphere web, uni web user interface. It is uh, the same one that goes in front of iPlant, uh, now Cybers, and a recent rename. Uh, we've got water-cooled doors, which are kind of cool, but somebody might be interested in those. And um, 100 gig networking back that we need to try and, uh, try and max out. Uh, so the atmosphere, if you're not familiar with it, it's, um, it's best described as a re-implementation of Horizon, but uh, it takes care of all the networking, the security groups, uh, a whole lot of stuff so that you can just click and go. Um, not exactly to scale, but a block diagram of, of Atmosphere and, and OpenStack, OpenStack being in the kind of lower right-hand quadrant there. Uh, the a little bit more about the water cool doors. Um, I, I just like them because they, they change colors. They've got tricolor LEDs, and uh, when it's when something goes wrong, you can uh, walk by the machine room and, and spot it as, at a distance. The um, the exhaust air, these actually cool the room. The exhaust is colder than the input. Okay, uh, screenshot of the, of the atmosphere uh, dashboard when you first log in. And this, uh, this kind of launch that I keep talking about. So you log in, you pick an image, you hit the launch button, you say what size, and you say whether you want to launch at uh, Bloomington or in Texas, and two or three minutes later you can log in, and that's really all that there is it to it. There's no, there's no setting up virtual routers or networking or any of that stuff. It's just click, click, go. The authentication winds up being slightly unusual. Um, one of our mandates was that there be no more that we not add another username and password. Um, so we're using OAuth2 and the Globus Auth uh, pieces to use the credentials that you normally log into at the top level of at the Exceed portal. So that winds up giving us uh, kicking back a username that we then map to attack username. Um, the attack accounts are synced via LDAP to us. Uh, we use Keystone Trust to impersonate the user and then use that token to, to hit OpenStack from there. Uh, we ran HPL, Linpack inside and outside of the VM. You can see the, the bare metal there and the, the cost of, of virtualization is kind of mapped out on the, in that slide too. Uh, some quick rally benchmarking. It takes about 10 seconds to, from, um, from doing the Nova boot request to being able to log in. Uh, laundry list of partners. We've partnered with, uh, I believe, 40 some partners, but these are the ones that'll fit in the slide. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and uh, laundry list of links. Now the uh, the use Jetstream. That's that's our um, that's our user interface. You can hit that right now. Kind of poke around. 
uh, look around and see what it what it looks like. Um, of course, the Exceed portal where you'll need to get an account, um, some training documentation, a, a very detailed paper, and uh, maybe the most important link if you are deploying yourself. I have. Um, a public GitHub repo that has every uh, stalled state configuration that we use to deploy this, uh, deploy the Bloomington system at least. The Texas guys based all of their puppet off of off of this repo. So, and this is live. So this is the configuration that is you know continuously applied today. So if you if you if you use this, then you'll wind up with whatever I have at any given time. So uh, for better or for worse. And depending on how you feel about public speaking, it's, I'm either very lucky or, or very unlucky to, to be up here today. And uh, I, I'm representing the, the hard work and, and considerable talents of, of dozens and dozens of people. Um, and here are a few of them, and I'm sure I've left some people out, but uh, they, are, they deserve a lot, of, a lot of the credit for all of this. And... Hi, I'm Robert. Uh, as Mike introduced me, I work for the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Bridges architecture and how it kind of um, fits the other gap uh, for the HPC needs. So what is Bridges? Um, we, we wanted Bridges to be a, a uniquely flexible resource in the HPC world. Um, the NSF wanted us to basically be able to support traditional and non-traditional workflows. Um, to kind of bridge the gap between communities, HPC, and big data. Uh, so we built a, a heterogeneous cluster. We wanted to be able to do a lot of different things. Um, the majority is general compute, uh, large shared memory, and then we also have sections of GPU nodes, um, database and web server specific nodes, and then also data transfer nodes for bringing in your data sets. So there's a lot of different use cases. Um, I'm only going to touch on a few since I'm not a scientist myself. Um, but basically, we do a lot of uh, big data application workflows. Um, we're doing science gateways and communities where they want to bring, um, set up a web service and have a, a workflow orchestrated through the web that submits to the private backend batch cluster. Um, other things like graph analytics, machine learning, um, really large memory in, in really large in-memory databases, um, and then other. Lots of genomics work we do at PSC. The, the PGR, the Pittsburgh Genomics Research uh, Center, we're working with Pitt to do a lot of things. They have some huge data sets that they're generating, uh, hundreds of terabytes of data that are being stored and, and processed. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but uh, we, if you want to know more information about the science, we can get you in touch with anybody that you'd like in your field. So a little about our, our technology partners. Um, HP Enterprise was the ones who did the compute servers. They did the architecture, the design and the installation of the hardware. Um, under the hood, it's uh, Intel. We're using Intel CPUs, their new OmniPath architecture, uh, Interconnect that I'll talk about a little bit later, and also recently acquired the Lustre file system that we use for a distributed file system at PSE. Um, also, the, the GPUs are NVIDIA. And then all of our storage servers, we kind of traditionally go with Supermicro and we roll those ourselves. So a little more in depth about the hardware. Um, this is the phase one. This is in production right now. Um, we just exited our early user test phase. And we're, we're, if you need grants or anything, we can apply. We can get you on there now. The, uh, there's 752 of what we call the RSM nodes. There are regular shared memory. They're kind of the general purpose compute. Um, there are, the features are they're 128 gigabyte of RAM. Um, four terabytes of local scratch storage, and they're the Intel Xeon E5s. And then a subset of that, we have 16 RSM nodes that have been packed with dual Tesla K80s. These are for doing the, the GPU uh, simulations, OpenACC type work, uh, or any other codes you have that could run and take advantage of the GPUs. And then to get into the more specialized nodes, we have what we call the LSMs and the ESMs, the, the large shared memory and the extra large shared memory. Um, the larger memory nodes are 3 terabytes of main RAM, and the extra large are 12 terabytes of main RAM. So we can support really high uh, um, memory intensive applications or these, these large data sets that, that need to be loaded in RAM and processed uh, where you don't want to take the performance penalty to be going off the disk or going off the distributed file system. 
Um, and then on the external side of things, we have database and web server nodes and data transfer nodes. And these will be um, externally accessible and also accessible to bridges private. So this will be kind of the gateway or the bridge of the gap between the private batch cluster and uh, you know a web a website or a, a web workflow like PGRR that that needs to be able to allow community users to come in and submit through a web portal and not really have to understand how batch HPC type jobs work. So the the phase one total is about 0.9 petaflops and about 144 terabytes of, of RAM. Um, in the summer, by the end of the summer, we should have the phase two. So we kind of staggered this to be able to take advantage of some, some new technology that's coming out. So we'll be adding 32 more of the GPU nodes with a uh, slightly higher revision of Intel Xeon processors that I believe are not quite out yet. And the same with um, the Intel coming out with a new generation of GPUs. Um, we're also going to add 32, 34 more of the LSM nodes and two more of the Superdome X nodes. So by the end of the summer, we should have a, a much larger pool also of these large shared memory nodes um, to facilitate user jobs. So one of the key points uh, for us was the Intel OmniPath architecture. Uh, we were the first major deployment of it. It's a 100 gigabit fabric. Um, all of Bridges Private is, is interconnected with this. It's designed to do really high um, message passing rate. They do 160 million messages per second. And so this is kind of our, uh, the HPC high performance side of things on the back end. Um, this is a architecture of how the network is laid out. Uh, you can go to bridges or psc.edu and you can see there's an interactive um, crow map that you can go through and you can look at the architecture and see how it's all laid out. Fairly, looks fairly complicated, but it's much simpler when you just look at the details. So now uh, might as well talk about the software stack. Uh, what are we doing? Well, obviously we're doing OpenStack because I'm here. Um, we're using OpenStack in a couple, couple different ways. Uh, the main way is we're using Ironic. Uh, the entire cluster is being bare metal booted mm -hmm. through OpenStack Ironic. Uh, we're using that as the, uh, the provisioning um, architecture behind pushing out the OSs. We're also doing uh, some virtual machines on the, si the science gateways um, and these database nodes. So we're using open, a separate OpenStack setup to facilitate the VMs. We use Slurm, uh, people that are, are um, familiar with traditional HPC systems. It's basically like PBS or LSF uh, or SunGrid Engine. It's basically a batch processing for doing MPI jobs or other, other batch type uh, work. We use Puppet uh, in conjunction with OpenStack and Ironic and all of these pieces to kind of spin up services uh, to do, handle the node configuration after uh, OpenStack pushes out the bare metal. And then on the back end, we've got two distributed file systems. We've got about 10 petabytes of disk that's split roughly right now 50-50 between Luster and Slash 2. Uh, Slash 2 is an in-house file system we developed that was designed to do data replication um, and archival storage. We're also doing some Docker. We've got, had a lot of uh, interest from users uh, wanting to do Docker and wanting to know how we're going to support Docker. So that's become a pretty hot topic uh, recently for us. Um, so, we're, uh, as I said, we're using multiple OpenStack setups. Um, let me skip through to the Ironic. So, uh, what we got from Ironic was we replaced our traditional HPC netboot infrastructure. Um, traditionally, we had been booting through Pixie and TFTP, very similar to how Ironic works, but we had problems with um, thinking how this would scale and how we would handle like image management, uh, how we would handle the, the organization of everything. Um, building all these images, we, we get a lot of functionality from Disk Image Builder. We can automate the, the building of the OS. We can automate um, adding all of our packages into it. So we gain all of these things through OpenStack. The other interesting thing is we gain the ability to, um, to provision based on the type of hardware it is. We can provision the storage with different images um, and the computes with different ones as well. So it gives us a really easy, flexible way to, to boot the nodes and not have to manage any of the Pixie and TFTP stuff um, manually. We wound up, we use Puppet to um, uh, automatically change the configuration of the, of the, of the computes on the fly. Um, the nodes take about 10 minutes to boot, give or take, so instead of rebooting every time with Ironic, we wind up, we have a larger disk image and we use Puppet to manage the services. 
whether it becomes a, a Hadoop cluster for, for a certain portion of time or whether it's spinning up Nova Computes and doing KVMs on the back end, et cetera. We can, we can control this with Puppet and use Ironic basically to do major updates and major image pushes out to the hardware. So the, for us, Ironic, the, the big uh, thing for us was to be able to take advantage of the Omnipath. Um, we have a very early generation, since we're the first to have it, that does not support SRIRV. So doing VMs for us is, is not really feasible. We want, to, we want people on the bare metal or on containers to be able to take full advantage of the interconnect that we have. The other thing is, that's great with the Ironic and Puppet is being able to reproduce the deployment. So we have, we have our Ironic image and we have Puppet that creates a service. We can wipe the node clean if something goes wrong and we can guarantee that it's in the exact same state that it was before. So for VMs, um, we have the separate setup. It's a Liberty. We're using Neutron with Open vSwitch. Uh, the main reason we're using Open vSwitch is um, all of our computes are in private space. So we wind up setting up OVS tunnels in order for any VMs to be able to talk externally. Um, so this allows users to be able to get in from the outside instead of having to bounce off our login nodes or set up some kind of proxy service. So it fits our, it fits our needs almost perfectly. Um, and then we, we offer both PSC managed and uh, OpenStack managed VMs. So if we have users that basically don't want to know the gory details, um, they just need a database, they want something spun up for them, they don't want to manage it, they don't need root access, we have VM, we'll have VM templates to spin this up for them, allow them to log in through their standard PSE, LDAP, um, exceed credentials. But if, for the advanced users that want more control, we just provision the resources into OpenStack and allow them to push out whatever images they'd like. Um, container support has become a big topic. Um, we see a big increasing support for Docker, and as I said, with, the, with our Omnipath iteration, we need to get the users to stay closer to the metal. Um, right now, this is kind of a thing we're working with, with the user through user services and sysadmins to, to facilitate spinning up these Docker containers. But we want to look at, we're looking at Magnum, we're looking at Nova Docker as a way to have OpenStack automate this process instead of having some manual intervention. I think some of the biggest things um, with Bridges is our roadmap. So we, we have lots of ideas. We're going to be migrating to Mataka. Um, probably as soon as I get home, I'll start working on that. But again, for, for looking at Magnum, Nova Docker, looking at ways to use OpenStack to set up our Hadoop, our Hadoop clusters or Hadoop portions on the fly instead of having you know, user services and our, our Hadoop guy have to do it manually. Um, the other great thing is as OpenStack improves, bridges can improve. So as these, these new projects come online, you know, we're seeing Trove and Sahara and Manila, we can incorporate those features and, and the bridges can, architecture can grow with the community. Um, the other thing we're doing is uh, I'm automating this piece with Slurm. Basically, if, if a user wants nodes in OpenStack, what we can do is I have scripting set up that the, the Slurm prologue can uh, spin up the Nova compute on their reservation. It can it metadata tags that hardware for them, sets up a, a proper flavor to that hardware spec, metadata tags it so that they're guaranteed that they can only run on, on the nodes that they have reserved in Slurm. So we end up using Slurm almost as the accounting uh, to keep track of how many, how many hours and how many cores, how much memory they've used, and we just let OpenStack do its thing. Um, the other thing we're going to be working on is Ironic Boot over the Omnipath. So we're planning on modifying the Ironic deploy image to uh, install the Omnipath drivers and set that up so we can push these images out the 100 gig pipe instead of out the back end um, giggy Ethernet. Um, we're also looking at containerized setup. We basically are looking for ways that we can roll out new releases, but in the event of something not being quite right, we can, we can easily roll back to what we know works. So I'm looking at Kala or Kola project um, to be able to facilitate this process. And that, I know that that project has come a long way from the last time I looked at it. So we're excited about what's happening in, in, in there as well. Um, and then also we want to do an increased HA setup. So uh, because our two clusters or our two OpenStack setups are split, we'd like to find a way to maybe unify them and then put it all into one single one and have more HA than having them separate. And a big thing for us is, uh, or for me uh, particularly, is to contribute back to the community. Uh, I'm a developer by nature and I do sysadmin as well, but I would like to fix some of the bugs I found, some of the scaling issues that we've seen, 
um, and push this back out to the community so that we can become a part of it and, and contribute back. Uh, for additional information, these are just um, uh, myself at the top and uh, our PIs. Uh, there's a ton of people behind the scenes as Mike said, that, that contribute in many different ways, whether it be from Puppet or, or networking. So I didn't even attempt to list them, <laughs> but uh, they really deserve a lot of credit as well. If you need more information, feel free to contact myself or um, our PIs, or just head to our website and you can check anything out for applying for grants or uh, getting time on the machine. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's actually a video. I did not know that. Anyways, um, so this is Bridges. It's a time lapse of it being built. Did not know that it was there. I thought it was a still image. But uh, I guess enjoy. If you have questions, um, feel free to uh, come up to the microphone and ask Mike or myself if you'd like to know anything more. Um, I have a question. Since you are the uh, first few using the Intel OmniPath, um, how's the performance with the MPI and OmniPath at this stage? So I'm not sure if I can attest to the, uh, the performance myself. Um, I could get you some numbers on that. I know that we're still working through um, you know, driver stuff with OmniPath, working directly with Intel. They've, um, they've been really good at supporting it and, and you know, on, coming on site and helping us with any problems we've had with, uh, with Luster or, or, or that. If you want specific numbers, if you would get into contact me, I can put you in, in, in touch with somebody that can. <clears throat> For the jet streams case, uh, for the CPU performance numbers, are yeah. you running the CERN suggested Nova tweaks to make it faster or not? No, that was just stock. Okay. Yeah, nothing, nothing special there, just, you know, took the stock. I recommend looking at them because that seems to be quite cool. Okay. Uh, either system or? <laughs> you want to take that one? Or? Uh, Accounting is still in process, so um, we're experimenting with uh, with Noki, and um, the Atmosphere web user interface also has its own accounting system and quota system, um, and it has a, a concept called an AU Atmosphere Unit, and so that's um, that is the overtime quota. Um, you know, in contrast with the traditional you know Nova. Quotas where they, um, yeah, which is which is the instantaneous, yeah. So um, it is it is still being worked on, and um, hopefully we'll have that hammered out here in, in a couple months. Uh, our acceptance review is uh, Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday, and uh, once we get the report back, we'll go into full production. We're in early operations right now, um, so we're thinking probably in the uh, June July time frame. That's our deadline to have all the accounting stuff worked out. So we, we've got a lot of a lot of work ahead of us. Yes, we we will we'll make every effort to, you know, kick stuff, kick stuff back upstream. Whatever it is, we figure out. I think we're kind of in the same boat for looking at Nyaki Cloud Kitty, but um, currently we've always done um, our accounting through PBS through the the, the batch resource. So since Slurm is spinning up the reservations on bridges. We, we already at least have that portion, and maybe we can fine grain tune it with what we see them actually using in OpenStack. But right now it would be basically them paying for the reservation to do cloud type stuff, or core hours for the back end batch stuff. On, in Bridges, uh, when the Slurm um, reservation expires, what happens to the VMs? That's a good question. So there's, um, there's an epilogue um, in the reservation also. Uh, what we'd like to do, we actually haven't encountered this yet, so we're going to be dealing with it, but the idea would be to snapshot the VMs or hopefully have the user do that, right? They know when the reservation ends. Um, they're kind of in charge of taking care of getting their data off the VMs or migrating or snapshotting it. Um, but I think what, what would be nice to do is to be have, a sender, have our sender back end store their snapshot for some period of time that if they're coming back to do more compute, they don't have to start over from from scratch with a, with a blank VM. Can you use the microphone, please? Actually, we get two questions. Um, one side you use salt, the other side you puppet.
Could you get into that a little bit? Explain why? Sure. Um, so I think it was about five weeks from the time we rolled the, the racks off the dock to the time we started our first VM. And I, th I had the feeling that that is, is kind of uh, faster than usual. We were, we were delayed by about six months, uh, but we didn't let any of our back-end deadlines slip. Um, so one of, the, one of the strategies was to go with stuff that we already, uh, we already use. So uh, the guys at TAC had deployed uh, Chameleon with Puppet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were really familiar with that. They had some stuff already built. Uh, I had been doing a uh, number of projects with Salt for the past several years, um, so I was comfortable with that. Um, so basically, it was it was the you know the, their functionality is very similar. It's uh, more about being familiar with your tools and getting up to speed um, with with new hardware and not new hardware and new config quickly. So, so the reason I ask is we are using Puppet and considering Salt at mm -hmm. the next step. And I'm wondering, is there any similarity that you know you could basically advance, taking advantage of if you know one, then you can move to the other. Easily? Yeah, I mean, yeah. so their their core functionality between all of them is you know, Puppet, Salt, Ansible, Chef, you know, CF Engine. You know, take your pick. Their you know their core functionality, their their uh, their mission is all the same. So you you just need a Rosetta Stone type, you know. And, and you can probably get up to, if, if you already are comfortable with it and know the concepts, you can probably get up to speed very quickly, just, you know, kind of comparing to two configs that do the same thing. Right, how about have both in the same environment? Because I have heard that you can use Ansible on top of Puppet, basically, to control different Puppets. Then. Sure. Um, actually, one of the kind of interesting things about uh, our user interface is they use Ansible um, to do a bunch of sysadmin type stuff uh, on behalf of the user on on startup, so that they you know they don't have to do a whole bunch of you know uh, sysadmin stuff that there is not necessarily on their critical path to getting their papers out the door. Right. Um, so yeah, we you know in, in that example we actually use two different configuration things, you know one <coughs> inside to, to manage OpenStack and one to manage all the, all the VMs that, uh, that get started on it. So I came in a little bit later so I might have missed it, but are, you, are there two different accountings here in this environment or one accounting? There, there is one accounting. Okay. Um, right. so the, but there's two separate clouds, two keystones, you know the, the user uh, the user IDs actually match, the passwords match, all of that, but they're not, uh, they're not dependent on each other. Um, I see. Do you, how do you track that? If I were to, so one user, can it have two accounts or just one user, it, it's one own? One, one account, uh, yeah, I'm, I may not have actually explicitly said that. The atmosphere um, was designed to span clouds. It's, yep. um, so at, uh, at VM instantiation, you pick which cloud, you know, or just take the default. So, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's capable of communicating uh, to two different OpenStacks. So does it mean that if, if, if I have, if I attach volume on with Nova on one cloud, then the other cloud would understand it and be able to use it, or no? No, it no, totally no. There's no federation separate. here, basically. No. Okay. And so federation is a thing that we are we have been talking about, and um, we replicate the images between the two clouds. Uh, so if you if you have an image in one place, uh, or even if you are running along and you decide you want to create a new image from your running instance, that will you know uh, FFT show up on the other side. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Over here. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions around what, what are you guys doing for uh, hardware monitoring and uh, management and also um, yeah, what are kind of the uh, performance of these? Okay, so the question was about hardware monitoring performance. And inventory. Yeah. In inventory. Yeah. Um, for, I know at PSC we're using Nagios uh, for a lot of our, or actually the, the spin off now, Naaman, um, to do most of our monitoring. Um, We've just used it in the past, and so it was, it was a logical 
fit to just bring over. We already had the infrastructure, um, most of the test cases that we wanted to monitor. Um, and then Puppet has stuff built in as well. Um, they have a, some kind of a, a web GUI that basically uh, watches for nodes, whether they're checking in um, or not. So we get feedback from both of those two things. Yeah, Zabbix uh, for some of the services, um, some of the open managed pieces. It's a Dell's our vendor. Um, so. How do you reliability of OpenStack? Reliability of OpenStack. <laughs> So some of the choices that I made were specifically for uh, being able to debug. Um, you know, with, with the Linux bridge, you can take TCP dump and, and watch every single packet go all the way through from end to end. Um, so that being said, there are some particular agents that are being restarted hourly on cron because they seem to just check out and so it's, but it's, uh, it's the best one yet. Um, Liberty so far is the best one yet uh, compared to Kilo and Juno. So I have high hopes for, you know, someday taking things out of Cron. Yeah, I would also say that uh, every release has gotten consistently better for Ironic. Um, there's still, there still are some issues. Um, I know we're almost, we're pretty much running out of time. I can take it offline, but there are a few scalability issues, nothing that were show stoppers. Um, I can touch more on that if, if people are interested, if you want to talk offline. Just one last question. How many users do you have so far? Oh, um, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. <laughs> hey, Jeremy. <laughs> Off the top of my head. We just came out of... 159 end users, 140 exceed staff. 159 end users, 140 exceed staff members. I'd have to check some stats for you. I don't have that in front of me right now. So, All right, well, thank you guys. Appreciate it.